Hi, my name is Jennifer Dyke, and I'm a senior planner in the Stormwater Management Division. This presentation is a slight modification of one we presented on January 26th to our Stormwater Master Plan stakeholder group and the public and staff that attended that meeting. We wanted to record it now and share it with you because we think it provides a good background on how and why our stormwater program was initiated and what our program has been focused on for the last 10 years. Understanding the history of our stormwater program and where we are today will help us as we plan for our next 10 years. And so today, the agenda for our presentation is one, I'm going to briefly talk about the goals of our master plan update and talk about how we're involving the stakeholders in public to make sure that we get their feedback and consider that as we move forward. And then Greg Simmons, our assistant director of the Stormwater Management Division, is going to come in and he's going to talk about the stormwater program and give a good overview of the program. He's going to talk about the initial program objectives for when the program began in 2006. And then he's going to talk about the progress that we've made since 2006 and where we are today. And then lastly, he's going to talk a little bit about the feedback that we got from the stakeholders during our first stakeholder meeting. So the goals of our Stormwater Master Plan update, as I said, is we want to go back and look at the progress that we've made since 2006 and learn from all the experience and the, the information that we've been gathering since then. Then we want to look at all this and we want to look at evaluate our opportunities and efficiencies to move forward. We want to try to be more strategic as we move forward and looking at the next 10 years. We want to hear back from our stakeholders in public and engage and align with them. And then we want to refine our strategies, policies, and priorities based off of all the information that we receive during the planning effort. Depending on what we come up with, we want to use that information and then align our future resource allocations, considering all this new information to really figure out how our program should be spending our funding for the better of City of Fort Worth. And then lastly, we want to develop an implementation plan. We want to have short, mid, and long-range objectives so we really know where we're trying to go during the next 10 years. We want to make sure that we have stakeholder endorsement for the product of our master plan. And then ultimately, we would like to get city council to adopt our master plan. So we really want to make sure that we get public feedback for our master planning process. And so we're having stakeholder group meetings that are open to the public. We're having a website and we're going to be adding information to the website during the course of the planning study. We're also sending emails to interested people who've been involved in prior stormwater efforts and who we think want to be involved in this effort as well. And then we're also posting information about these meetings on the city calendar and on Nextdoor to try to reach out to more people who we think might be interested in participating in the process. And so we formed a, a pretty diverse stakeholder group. We have representatives from all the city council districts, as well as some representatives that were part of our stormwater committee that was formed when the division was started. So now I want to talk a little bit about our schedule as we move forward. This master planning process is around a year process, and so we are right where the first star is right now. We just had our first stakeholder engagement meeting. We're planning to have four stakeholder meetings total, and all of these meetings are open to the public. And after this meeting, we're planning to start a benchmarking process. So we're going to go and look and see what other cities are doing in terms of stormwater. And we're going to learn what they're doing and see if there's something new or different that we want to put into our implementation plan moving forward. And so our next stakeholder meeting will be around the end of our benchmarking process, where we'll come back and we'll share with the stakeholders in public what we've learned during the benchmarking project and come up with some thoughts moving forward and get feedback from everyone at that point in time. And then we'll start working on the implementation plan. So the goal is at the end of 2017 to have a draft plan and then to move forward with city council adoption in early 2018 of that plan. And now our assistant director, Greg Simmons, is going to come and talk about and give an overview for how we got to where we are today. This is Greg Simmons. I am, as Jennifer mentioned, the manager of the Stormwater Management Program and assistant director in the Transportation and Public Works Department. I've been with the program since shortly after it was established. And so, again, what we would like to do is provide some background on what's been going on with the program for the last 10 years to try and set the stage for the consideration that we're in right now in determining what the direction of the program needs to be for the next 10 years. So the stormwater program was first discussed back in the summer of 1999. There had been some flooding events that year, as there had been before that periodically, but never frequently enough 
for any serious consideration to be given to doing something differently to try and address the drainage problems in the city. But in summer of 99, there was a lot of flooding, and so there were some discussions about needing to establish something that would be more effective in dealing with drainage problems in the city of Fort Worth. But as happens many times, you enter into a period where there's not so many rain events, and it just kind of is not discussed as much anymore. But in the summer of 2004, there was again a series of major floods in different areas. And so that was uh, the event, kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. A lot of citizens came down to the city council and uh, really, in some ways, demanded that something be done, that the city start doing more to address the flooding problems in the city of Fort Worth. So the city council responded by tasking the city manager and city staff to establish a committee of citizens to work with city staff to look at this issue. And so that happened in October in 2004. The results of that process, about a year of activity there, was to establish a stormwater program. And so that decision was made in December of 2005 to really do something to establish a much more robust, well-resourced program to address flooding in the city of Fort Worth. So one of the things that those committees did, or that committee did, was really try and establish where we were as of 2006 versus where we wanted to be. So kind of a gap analysis. And they looked at several different areas related to a drainage program. One of the most noteworthy ones, uh, one of the biggest ones, is capital projects, which are the big infrastructure projects to expand the capacity of the drainage system to handle and prevent flooding. Before 2006, there was very little resources given to these sorts of projects, and the estimate at that time was that there was about a half a billion dollars of backlog and not really any resources to do anything about it. And so the desired outcome was to have some sort of reasonable, predictable uh, funding stream to address those things, and so that was the first gap that was established in that study relative to the maintenance of the system. So again, the drainage system, like any other infrastructure system or an appliance or a facility, has to be maintained well. Before 2006, there was very little resources applied to maintaining the system. It was basically a reactive sort of thing. When something broke, the city sent someone out to do something about it and try and fix what was broke, but really didn't have any resources to be proactive on that. And so the desired a state would be to be proactive and actually understand what needed to be done, prioritize those things, schedule them, and accomplish them. One of the biggest challenges that we had at that time was a incomplete inventory. We really didn't know, relative to the drainage system, what we had, where it was, what condition it was, and so there was a lot of recognition that one of the highest priorities for the stormwater program when first established would be to get together the data that we needed to understand the drainage system that exists in the time. And again, so understanding uh, where the pipes were, where the channels were, how old they were, what their design intent was, what condition they were in, materials, those sorts of things, that was the desired outcome relative to the inventory. On the planning side, again, we really didn't understand much about what the drainage system could do in various parts of the city. The city is broken into, uh, the way we look at it, a bunch of drainage basins, and we only had about 5% of that relative to understanding how the drainage system was functioning, what it could handle, what flood risks there were, and have any idea of what we might be able to do to improve things. And so there was a desire to really correct that, where we could have a full understanding to some level of the drainage system in the city of Fort Worth and again the ability to know what needed to be done to correct problems and how problems in different areas compared to each other. One of the biggest factors relative to the flood risk in the city, just like any other city, is new development. As new development comes in, it has a great opportunity or ability to impact the drainage situation in the city. And if it's not regulated correctly, if it's not reviewed correctly, then new development can significantly exacerbate uh, flooding problems. And Back in 2006, we had old standards. We only had one person who spent part of his time reviewing new development. And so there was a recognition that the standards needed to be updated, that we needed to resource a program to actually be actively reviewing new development to make sure that it wasn't making things worse. 
the whole program had very outdated equipment and technology. And so uh, to try and be effective and efficient in executing a program, it was recognized as that that needed to be updated significantly. And our public education program was very limited. It was primarily related to water quality issues. It wasn't really addressing and helping people understand flood risk in the city, uh, what they could do, what the city could do, and different factors related to flood risk. And so, again, there was a recognition that we really needed to up the game in that regard. Another way of looking at the gap would be look at resources. What sorts of resources did we have at that time, and what could that get us? And so... A consultant that worked with us before the program was established went out and looked across the country and looked at different levels of program and tried to compare those programs to what the city of Fort Worth had and where the city of Fort Worth wanted to go. And they looked at it based on the overall budget for a stormwater program and how that broke down in these different areas based on the acreage of the city and how effective that program was. And so based on that study, they said, if you want an incidental stormwater program, that'll probably cost you about $25 an acre. And for a city the size of Fort Worth, that would work out to be about a $5 million budget. Where we were, uh, as of 2006, we had about a $7.6 million annual budget. So that worked out to about $38 uh, per acre for the city of Fort Worth. So that put us uh, just a little bit above what was considered an incidental program. The next three levels of program this study uh, identified, again, by looking at cities across the country, were anywhere from minimal to aggressive. And so you can see on the slide there the dollars associated with that per acre and for a city the size of Fort Worth, what the annual budget would be if we resource the program to that level. So in looking at these different gaps and trying to figure out where the city wanted to be, the outcome of that look with the citizen committee was that the city of Fort Worth uh, wanted to be a little bit above what was defined to be an aggressive program around the country. So we wanted to be aggressive, particularly in the areas of planning and understanding the drainage needs across the city and getting that inventory together and reviewing new development and maintaining the system. It was recognized given the magnitude of the capital improvement need, the CIP program, that it probably wasn't gonna be realistic to consider ourselves aggressive. Again, that half a billion dollar a backlog, as was estimated back then, was recognized we couldn't be aggressive there. But if you put all that together, the estimate was is that we would need about $32 million a year by the fifth year of the program being established. And so that would work out to be about $160 per acre. And if we wanted to go really all out and uh, kind of have the state of the art top level program as compared to other programs in the country at that exceptional level, it would cost about $50 million a year. And so uh, the committee and city staff came back to city council and recommended this aggressive program at about $32 million a year by the fifth year. So how to get that money together is the big thing. Without raising taxes, there was a need to identify how the program would be funded. So a stormwater utility is a, a tool that many, many cities have begun using over the last few decades because many cities have the same issue that the city of Fort Worth does, and a stormwater utility becomes the thing many times that is established to fund the needs. And so this study that we underwent that recommended the establishment of stormwater utility and recommended the funding levels you saw on the previous slide came up with this progressive rate structure over the first five years of the program. So the dollars you see there, as it says, is this was the monthly fee per billing unit that was recommended over those first five years. A billing unit for the stormwater utility fee is 2,600 square feet of impervious surface on a piece of property. Impervious surface is anything that keeps the ground from absorbing water, like pavement or a building. And so it was uh, decided that if we assessed every property owner in the city of Fort Worth according to this fee structure, that we could begin to develop the sorts of resources we needed to reach the goals that we were trying to reach. So that was what was looked at initially, and that was what was projected initially. And the original projections didn't say anything beyond year five. They were just focused on how to ramp things up by the fifth year to get us where we wanted to go. So here's what actually happened. In this particular row, I have both the rate 
that was established in each year and the resulting overall revenue. So, for example, in FY07, we started out, as was recommended, at $2.90 per month per billing unit. That resulted in an overall revenue that year about $10.2 million. So you can see over the years, we did have some fee increases. By the fifth year, we actually were a little bit ahead in terms of the recommended fee of what was recommended initially. However, that only got us $28 million in revenue, so we did not quite reach that $32 million a year revenue in year five. However, in FY12, our last fee increase, we raised the fee to $5.40 per month per billing unit. And as we sit here in fiscal year 17, our projected revenue for this fiscal year is $38 million. Just looking at our fee relative to others across the country, an organization named Black and Veatch does an annual stormwater utility fee survey of cities across the country. I think there's about 80 cities that respond to this, and you see some of the ones uh, called out along the bar there, as well as a number of ones from Texas, so you can compare Fort Worth to. And so Relative to other cities across the country, we're about middle of the pack in terms of how much we charge for our stormwater utility fee. Now, these aren't completely apples to apples because some cities do different things with their stormwater utilities than others do. But generally speaking, it's safe to say that our fee is about middle of the road as compared to other cities across the country. Looking at our revenue relative to where it comes from, we have a single-family residential billing and we have basically everything else. And so the great majority of the accounts we have are the single family residential. However, 60, almost 60% of our revenue comes from non-single non family residential. And I'll show you a little bit later what that looks like for some very large rate payers. So let's talk a little bit about what we do with all those resources. What is the program all about? Well, the stormwater management program is uh, very much like any other program in the city of Fort Worth in that we take our cues on what we do and how we shape our mission based on the direction from the city council. And so the city council has established several strategic goals for the city. They want the city of Fort Worth to be a safe city. They want mobility to be something which contributes to the city instead of creating a problem. They want the city to be clean and attractive, want everything to be focused on making the economic base strong in the city and for new development for it to be orderly and sustainable. And so these are the sorts of things that we, the stormwater program, look at and say, where do we fit in? How can we contribute best to that? We've established a mission statement is protect people and property from harmful stormwater runoff. And so immediately you can see the connection between that and the safe city. And it is correct to say that much of our program really is a public safety program. However, for each of these other city council strategic goals, there's a very direct linkage as well. If roadways are flooding, then mobility is impaired. Drainage systems in the way they're constructed and the way they function can either contribute to or detract from the cleanliness and the attractiveness of the city. If there are flood prone properties that are chronically flood prone, really makes it hard to develop them in a way where they can achieve their value and strengthen the economic base. And of course, new development, as, as we've already discussed, if that's not being reviewed carefully, then it can actually create and aggravate flooding problems in areas which would then take away from orderly and sustainable development. And so our program really is directly connected to all of the city council strategic goals with a real focus on public safety. As the committee uh, initially was looking at the program, they tried to sum up what we wanted to do. Again, how we wanted to breach that gap between where we were and where we wanted to be. And there was a recognition, uh, very simplistically stated, that we needed to make things better than they were right then. One of those ways of making it better was we had a drainage system. We needed to make sure that it was doing the best it could do. So that was the maintenance and repair program. And again, recall that there was a desire to have a aggressive maintenance and repair program because even if the city's drainage system in some cases was not adequate, we wanted it to be able to do everything it possibly could do. But again, knowing that even when a system is doing as much as it can do, in many cases, it's not big enough to handle enough runoff to give the level of protection from flooding that was desired. So we also needed to identify those areas, prioritize those areas, and conduct projects to expand the capacity of the system to make it handle more and protect people from flooding. 
We also wanted to be able to be in a position where we could do a better job of warning people of road hazards. So again, there's many locations around the city of Fort Worth when it rains really hard, water comes over the road that creates a hazard for motorists. Before the stormwater utility was established, there wasn't really any way other than a few signs to warn people of those. And so we wanted to be in a position where we were much better about warning people at least that there was a hazard that they needed to take precautions against. So making things better was the first very simple way of phrasing up what we wanted to do. The second was we needed to keep things from getting worse. So we knew it was going to take a long, long time to keep chipping away at making things better. In the meantime, we wanted to make sure that we weren't making things worse. And so there were two ways of trying to do that. First is once we got different sections of the drainage system doing what they could do and functioning as they were designed, we needed to make sure we maintained that. It wasn't going to do much good to spend a lot of effort to get something up if it was not maintained. And so we're really about the business of trying to keep the progress that we've made there. The second piece, again, relates to development review. And so new development is probably the biggest risk at making things worse. And again, as I've already said, if we weren't reviewing that carefully, then that could create worse flooding problems than existed. So what I'm going to do now is go through each one of these rows on this table. These are all the areas that showed up earlier as defining what the gap was and just talk about what we've done in the last 10 years. So on the capital side, uh, big projects to try and reduce flooding. Here's some of the main facts associated with the capital program for the last 10 years. Again, recognize that what was estimated initially was about a half a billion dollar backlog. We actually learned over the ensuing years that really the backlog was a lot larger than that, trying to get your arms around how much it would cost to fix something just by understanding or looking at a drainage problem is very hard. So the overall backlog is probably much larger than half a billion dollars. So we, know, we knew we needed a lot of money and the way to get a lot of money was to sell debt. And so the stormwater utility since 2008 has sold $150 million in debt to fund capital projects. So that's been spent out pretty much over about a 10-year period. The last of those funds should be spent this year. So that works out to be about $15 million a year or so for capital projects. We do a lot of small projects, uh, so the average project less than a million dollars. So we do lots of projects. Many times for just a little bit of money, you can do a lot of good. And the largest single project that we've done so far is about six million dollars. And so you can see that our focus has been to try and take that $150 million and spread it as widely as we could, address as many problems as we could, which primarily are fairly small projects. We've also tried to leverage our funding with other entities like the Fort Worth School District, Tarrant County, the Fort Worth T, and some other private partners. So that $150 million is what the city put together with revenue bonds to address drainage problems. But we also try and get other people who have joint interest with us and, and a joint stake in solving flooding problems. And we work with them, so that allows us to make our money go even further. So that $150 million in revenue bond, we pay $9.4 million every year to service the debt on that, and we will continue doing that until the 2030s. The first of those revenue bonds will be paid off in 2033, and then over about a four-year period, we'll pay off all of those, all that $150 million. So at that point, we'll be in a position with that revenue stream that we can actually start a revolving fund sort of process where we can, as we retire debt, we can sell more debt potentially, but that's a long ways off. So we're 16 years from the first of that and about 20 years before we've got all of that paid off. So we're quite a ways away from getting getting ourselves to the point where we can actually start a revolving fund sort of approach to the capital program and selling debt. So with this $150 million, we've really got most of what we call the low-hanging fruit projects completed. What we mean by low-hanging fruit are the ones where a solution was fairly straightforward and where you could achieve a lot of flood reduction for a little bit of money and where we could spread that benefit around the city. Uh, one of the charges given to the stormwater utility as we first started is we needed to make sure that we were really addressing needs all over the city and really start to show some progress as quickly as we could. And so uh, the priority and that day was to get out there and identify these projects that could be completed quickly, could realize benefit, could be seen all over the city. And we've done that. That's really where we focused. And most of those at this point 
have been completed. And so that's good, and that's good progress. The downside is, is what remains, as I'll show you in the next slide, is pretty considerable. Another way of looking at what the capital program has accomplished is in terms of the drainage problems, uh, the number that have been addressed. So a rough estimate some time ago was that when we started, there were about 167 areas in the city that had a very significant drainage problem, what we would call a critical drainage problem. And so with the money so far uh, in the last 10 years, we will have knocked out over half of those. And so, again, that's good, and that shows a lot of progress. But as I just mentioned, one of the challenges that the program has, and we'll go into more detail on this here in just a moment, is that those remaining areas are a lot of the really hard very large, very expensive ones. And so we've made good progress in terms of reducing the number of areas, but the remaining areas are gonna be really hard and very expensive to address. Finally, in terms of outcomes, a couple of the things that we look at to try and communicate to people what they get for this program is the number of properties that receive mitigated flood risk from our program and the amount of traffic on roadways that have had hazardous road overtoppings, which are now protected. And so the program to date, uh, about s over 700 properties have had the flood risk significantly mitigated, either by a project which increases the capacity of the drainage system so that they're no longer at risk, or in some cases by acquiring the property. And so that property owner then has the ability to go acquire a property somewhere else in the city, which isn't flood prone. And then the average daily traffic on these roads where we have corrected a hazardous road overtopping situation is over a quarter of a million dollars every single day or a quarter million vehicles every single day. And so those people have a significantly higher level of protection than they did before the projects. Just a few pictures of some of the things we've done. One of those hazardous road overcrossing places was in kind of near southeast Fort Worth, just on the east side of 35. Uh, this is a location where in 2004, a young lady and two small children lost their lives at this location. We have since gone in and built a bridge there to eliminate that particular hazard. A similar location on the east side of Fort Worth uh, by the Bell helicopter plant. There's a red car in the woods back there that got washed off the road, and this, is, this was a fairly frequent happening in that area. It's a very low-lying floodplain area. Again, we've gone in and we've constructed a bridge at that location, so that's no longer a hazard. In the Eastern Hills neighborhood on the east side of Fort Worth, kind of Meadowbrook area, what you're looking at uh, looks like a ball field, and that's what it is, but it also doubles as a detention pond. So this is in front of Eastern Hills High School and Eastern Hills Elementary School, and this detention area was a partnership with the school district whereby we built them some new ball fields, but in heavy rains, it functions as a detention area, and it's one part of a, a very significant part of a drainage protection project for the neighborhood there, which had some chronic flooding. And finally, in Sansom Park, kind of the north side, again, uh, one of the very vivid graphic example of the risk created by these hazardous road overtoppings So the young man sitting up on the hill. I was very fortunate to be able to get out of that car and get up on that hill. And since that time, we've, uh, again, built a bridge there. And so uh, the level of risk at that location has been significantly reduced. One final project uh, to make note of is at the Luella Merritt School. This is off Camp Bowie West, just south of the big traffic circle, and is another partnership with the Independent School District. So here's another neighborhood that had some significant flooding issues. We were able to identify a piece of school district-owned property that would really function well as a detention area. And so we approached the school district again, similar as at the Eastern Hills area, and said, what if we built you some ball fields here? And then in heavy rains, they would serve uh, temporarily as a detention area in the school district based on what had happened. The success we'd had at Eastern Hills was agreeable to that. So we did that, and this, this is a project which actually won a Project of the Year Award through the Stormwater Solutions magazine. So that's what we've been doing. Now, just to give you a little bit of a feel for what remains to be done, I'm going to go through each council district and give you just one example of a project that needs to be done and kind of the scale so you can see some of the challenges we're facing in terms of being able to fund 
these big capital projects. So each one of these council district maps is going to have a bunch of icons, and the stars represent places where we've either done a project, we're planning a project, or one is underway right now. All the other icons represent, in one way or another, a flood hazard which has been reported since 2009. It's only since 2009 that we've been gathering this sort of data, but you can just get some feel for the level of flood risk that exists in the district just by looking at these different icons. So in Council District 2, one of the biggest drainage problems is along a channel called Lebeau Channel. We've actually been working on that in phases for a while. We've already spent a good bit of money to try and improve things there, mainly by, again, building bridges to eliminate hazardous road overcrossing situations. But to finish this out, it would probably cost about 40 to $50 million. Now, it is something that we can phase in over time. We can do pieces of the project and realize benefits along the way. But to fix the whole problem is going to be about 40 to $50 million. Council District 3 in the West Cliff area. To correct the flooding problem that we've identified there, we estimate it'll cost somewhere between 15 and $20 million. And let me say this too, that these cost ranges that you're seeing here are based on just the level of engineering that has been done is not enough to make it more precise. And so we're giving you our best estimate of a range of cost uh, because until more engineering is done, we really don't know. In Council District 4, the Riverside area, we estimate 15 to $20 million just to provide protection from a 50-year rain event. Typically, we try and shoot for protection from a 100-year event, which is the event that has a statistical probability of about 1% every year of occurring. In this particular case, the study uh, realized that it was going to be completely cost prohibitive to provide 100-year level protection, So, but we thought for a 15 to $20 million, a 50-year level of protection could be achieved, which would be a very, very dramatic improvement for this area. Council District 5, the Stop 6 area. This is a part of town where there's a lot of focus in the city right now of really doing some economic revitalization, but based on the condition of the drainage system, the capacity of the drainage system, there's some significant flooding problems. We've done some studies out there that suggest it would cost anywhere from 12 to $15 million to address those. Council District 6, the Garden Acres area, 20 to $25 million. Council District 7 has one of the uh, most chronic worst problems, which is in the Arlington Heights neighborhood. Cost estimate uh, for that is 25 to $80 million. This cost range is a little bit different than the ones I've been reporting because this reflects at the lower end, at the $25 million end, a lower level of protection. That's just from a five-year storm. If you wanted to go all the way up to 100-year level protection, which would entail a tunnel pipe system all the way from Arlington Heights to the river down kind of at the close to the TCU area, that would be at the $80 million range. So just to provide significant level of protection there, increase would be $25 to $80 million. In Council District 8, this is a different sort of project. This is actually not a flood mitigation project. This is the sort of project, though, that is going to become uh, probably increasingly the focus of the program, which is the fact that a lot of our pipe system is falling apart. And so we pulled one example of that for an area where it's got an old pipe system that's got some significant issues that is at risk of collapse and uh, looked at that area and thought to do the rehab that's needed, 8 to $10 million. That wouldn't do anything to make the system handle more water, but it would keep uh, us from having some sort of catastrophic collapse. And finally, Council District 9, kind of the Barry McCart area, estimates are 25 to $30 million. And again, that's not a 100-year solution. We figure to provide protection for a 100-year event, again, would just be cost prohibitive, and so 25 to $30 million. So if you add all of those up, just one example from every council district, you get anywhere from $160 million to $350 million a year in capital needs. The funding that we project for the future uh, without some sort of adjustment in the program is only 8 to $10 million a year. So again, you can see that the need for the capital program is significant, and it's significantly higher than the resources uh, that we've got. So this is one of the significant challenges that we have as a stormwater program program. Finally, on the capital program, again, one of the ways when we can't uh, readily or quickly fix a flooding problem, uh, especially a hazardous road overtopping issue, is we try to provide 
a warning system. And so we've got 53 places around the city where we now have a fairly good, uh, timely way of notifying people or warning people when there's a hazard. We still have a couple of hundred areas where we don't have this, though, so that's still a need. On the maintenance side, again, we are reactive back in 2006, wanting the move to be proactive, prioritized, and scheduled. So over the last 10 years, we've done a lot with technology to take the resources we have and be smarter, a work order system which helps us understand and record much better what the needs are around the city, uh, what the frequency of problems are, how much it costs, uh, has been a key to working smarter there. Also, getting in the hands of our field employees, uh, GIS data. GIS is an acronym for Geographic Information System, which basically takes data, in our case, data about the drainage system, puts it on a map, and so people out in the field can come in the area, they can pull up on a map, they can very quickly get a lot of information about the drainage system that is there that really helps them be a lot more efficient about what they're doing. All of our vehicles also now have an automatic vehicle locator which helps the managers really know how to use resources in a much more efficient and effective way. We've had a lot of focus on improving the processes and taking the resources that we have and realigning them and focusing them in the areas where we're most effective and efficient, and so that's yielded a lot of benefit. And we're also continuing to seek more efficiencies. One of those ways is by establishing a new service center. Our only service center that we have right now where all of the people who maintain the drainage system in the city of Fort Worth, where they work from, is in far south Fort Worth, that red star in far south Fort Worth off Columbus Trail is where they all are. So it takes a good 15 minutes just to get to an interstate from there, and they're trying to maintain the system all over the city. In about a year, we will be opening a new service center. That's that star way up in the north side of Fort Worth off Bonds Ranch Road in 287. That one has much more ready access to highways, Highway 287 and our Interstate Highway 35. And so that will improve our operational efficiency significantly by splitting our maintenance forces between two locations. And we've also got a three-year rolling maintenance plan, which helps us prioritize and plan things out much more effectively. So the main things they do is they maintain channels about 170 plus miles, but only about a quarter of those are in a state now where they can be actively maintained. So a big focus on the program is getting the rest of that mileage up to a status where it can be actively maintained. And part of that program is also culverts, bridge culverts, like you see in the picture there. They get clogged up in heavy rains with a lot of debris. We have to keep those things clear. It takes a lot of resources. We also have to maintain the, the vegetation along roadside ditches and these channels. So we get about 50 plus miles that we do this for. Again, there's a lot more need out there than we're able to get to, but we've come a long ways in the last 10 years. The inlets, which are basically, if you are familiar with looking at the curb line and seeing a hole where the water goes down into the pipe system, that's what we call an inlet. There's over 30,000 of those in the city of Fort Worth, and we have the resources to clean or inspect about 8,000 a year. And so we can get around to these once every three years or so, which isn't too bad, and we focus those uh, efforts on the most important inlets too, so we get to the ones more frequently that have a greater risk of creating problems. And so we've come along way in that area as well. And finally, the concrete associated with a drainage system, whether that's some sort of armoring along a channel like you see in the picture that these men are working on, uh, or the pipe system itself, uh, which in many cases is concrete. We have crews that go out and repair these systems. And one thing to note is that over 30% of the pipes we have are over 50 years old. So as I mentioned before, in one of those pictures, uh, that's where a lot of our need is going to be for the coming years, is a lot of those pipes are gonna start really creating problems for us if we don't go in and repair those now. And here's one more slide on that. So again, we, we don't have much of a rehab program right now. Uh, primarily, we just react to things when they happen. A failure of a pipe system usually manifests itself by some sort of depression or, in the worst case, some sort of sinkhole. So when those happen, we respond to them, but we don't have the ability right now to be very proactive on that. And so that's what we're trying to do as our storm drain pipes get older and older trying to get ourselves in the position where we have a good, better understanding of where the needs are and we can really get on those in a proactive way before they become a big problem. So relative to the inventory, you know, come a long ways with that as well. We now have a pretty complete storm drain inventory. We have good records again uh, in the GIS system 
accessible via maps, uh, where the pipes are, how old they are, what condition they're in, if we have some sort of data that would indicate that. And we've taken that data and kind of uh, done a study to try and help us understand where the most critical areas are. So based on various factors, condition of the pipe, age of the pipe, type of soil around the pipe, we've tried to identify the ones that appear to be at the greatest risk of some sort of problem, and if they have some sort of problem, would create the worst consequences. And so the maps you see there on the right side of the slide, the green, yellow, red, are kind of an indication of where the worst ones are, with the red being the worst, and you see that they tend to be more focused in the center part of the city, which is the older part. Uh, and then the map uh, at the far right corner is a little zoom in on one of those areas that we can do. We can really look much more carefully at which parts of the pipe system have the greatest risk of failure and the greatest consequences if they do fail. And in progress, uh, we are doing a lot more now to assess the insides of the pipes. That really requires running a TV camera through it in most cases. And so we've got over 900 miles of pipe, and so it takes a long time to do that. But we're starting that now, again, identifying some of the most critical ones and starting to do a condition assessment from the inside. And we are also just now launching an inventory of our channel system. So we've done it with the pipes, the inventory with the pipes, but what we don't have really good comprehensive data on is the channel system around the city. So that's kind of the next big piece of our inventory and condition assessment program. On the planning side, we've done a lot again. Uh, we've done uh, citywide assessments, which give us a real high level understanding of where some of the worst risk areas are for flooding. Potential high water areas is what we call them. The map that you see there at the right is a reflection of kind of that high level of engineering, which was done to try and figure out uh, based on the capacity of the pipe system and the topography of the area where water is going to pond and go when it can't get in the system. And so that helps us focus on where the highest priority needs. We're doing something similar in channels now with trying to understand and identify where we've got the worst risk of erosion that could create problems. And so this is information which is really just available in the last few years and is very much helpful in, in guiding and prioritizing our program. We have done pretty detailed engineering assessments on over 40 watersheds, or those are drainage basins. Those are areas in the city where the water, the runoff flows to a common place like a river or a creek. So we've got about 40 of those throughout the city where we've got pretty detailed engineering on those. And we've taken this sort of information and, and we've been able to look at the 200 plus drainage basins in the city and assign them a grade. Again, kind of a green, yellow, red sort of uh, approach where the red indicates the worst and that map at the right, you see a, a picture of what we've come up with. And again, you see most of the red is in the center part of the city uh, where the system is older and the, the design standards were not then what they are now. And so those are where a lot of our worst problems are. And we're also in, this, in the process right now of taking the information that we have about uh, flood risks and alternatives for fixing flooding problems and really trying to prioritize those in a very objective way so that we can understand where the best use for our resources is, knowing that we've got such a, a big backlog. And finally, uh, in this, we also have doing a little bit more in terms of water quality and trying to install water quality devices which catch trash or sediment before they get to a creek or a river. And we've got 16 of those in place now and we inspect them on a quarterly basis and clean them as needed. Relative to design standards, again, new development. So when the program started, uh, we had a drainage manual uh, that was at that time about 40 years old. It was a very good drainage manual, but it was very old, needed to be updated. Again, we didn't have much in the way of resources to enforce those. And so we now have a new manual. In 2006, we established it. We've updated it twice since then, most recently about a year and a half ago in September 2015. So we've got a very update manual, which is used for uh, our people to assess new development around the city to try and keep it from making things worse. And what those people do is they review drainage plans for private development against those standards. The goal is to make sure that those new developments don't create an adverse impact on anyone else. However, we want to execute the program in such a way that we don't unnecessarily 
squelch new development. That was a big goal early on is, is we, we definitely need to do this, but we don't want it to be so rigid or unreasonable or so hard that it chases away new development because the new development obviously is a very important part of the city's economic growth. We've got seven full-time employees that work doing this. We've got two consultant contracts which do reviews for us. We completed over 1,500 reviews in 2016, and it took us on average about 8.7 business days, so a little less than two weeks to turn those reviews around. And in addition to all those reviews, lots and lots of meetings all the time, developers and engineers coming in, calling, sending emails, uh, scheduled and impromptu. And so these people who do this stay very, very busy with all the activity that's going on in the city of Fort Worth trying to keep up with the new development. Also in our development services, our floodplain management. So these are the folks that actually oversee kind of on behalf of FEMA, the FEMA floodplains in the area. So they are also a part of the development review process for those properties which are actually in the FEMA designated floodplain areas. So they work with FEMA to try and make the floodplain maps as current as they possibly can. They also administer what's called the community rating system, which would directly translates into the flood insurance premiums that are charged to property owners in Fort Worth that are required to carry flood insurance, which are those that have a mortgage and are in a FEMA floodplain. So how we do with our program directly affects the flood insurance premiums that people pay. Right now, we are at a community rating system level eight, and that basically turns in, translates into a 10% discount on flood insurance premiums for property owners in Fort Worth that are required to carry flood insurance. And just recently, about a year ago, was completed a floodplain management plan, which tries to make this program much more comprehensive, much more strategic, uh, and also helps us with our community rating system rating. Relative to technology and equipment, we've talked about that a lot already. Primarily a lot of that is relative to the maintenance program. So we've talked about the work order asset management system, which tracks our maintenance work orders, the GIS stuff that we have now, which gives field folks this information in the field. And they've got these tablets, these little kind of uh, computer laptop sort of computers, which give them that information in the field. And again, the vehicle locators that we've already mentioned and the different pieces of equipment uh, that we have, which have been a significant upgrade to our maintenance program and really made things much more efficient and effective. Finally, public education. We do an annual newsletter, which goes out to everyone, giving them a lot of information about our program, about things they need to know about flooding, again, about what they can do to help themselves, what we can do to help them, how to contact us. Also online, we've got a website, which gives a lot of information about different projects we're doing. From time to time, we'll have questionnaires that we can ask people for their input. We also send out email blasts to different neighborhoods at different times related to different projects. And we also conduct public meetings about different initiatives we have. And finally, like everyone else, we're trying to really make the best use we can of social media to inform and educate people. So rate payers. All this money, again, I mentioned before that the non-single-family residential is where most of our money comes from. So I wanted to give you some idea of comparison between single-family residential and those others. So an average single-family resident pays about $65 a year for stormwater utility fees. So that's significant. It's nothing to be just passed off, but it's not that dramatic of a cost. However, for the big rate payers, uh, the city of Fort Worth itself is the single biggest rate payer. We actually charge ourselves for stormwater utility fees. So we pay almost $800,000 a year in stormwater utility fees. So that translates into about the salaries of 15 police officers. Our second biggest rate payer in the city of Fort Worth is the Fort Worth Independent School District. Uh, so for the amount of money they pay in stormwater utility fees, they could pay about 13 new teachers, put them on staff. Alliance Airport between American Airlines and FedEx uh, pays about a quarter of a million dollars a year in stormwater fees. So I put all that out there just to help you understand that when we start looking at these resources, and particularly if we start considering raising fees, uh, that there's organizations out there that pay lots and lots of money uh, for stormwater utility fees. And so it has a big impact on them as those adjustments are made. 
One other thing that we do have is a credit program. So by doing certain things relative to how they handle drainage on site, different properties can be eligible for some reductions in their stormwater fees. So schools, for example, if they do a public education program, uh, we give them, I think it's a 10% discount on their stormwater utility fee. And there's various other things that different entities can do to try and help make the drainage system better uh, and benefit themselves by paying less stormwater utility fees. Here's how that budget breaks down. All that revenue breaks down into these different areas. So these are kind of the different areas that we've been talking about, and you can see the different amounts of money that go into each one. On that top line, about $19 million a year for flood reduction capital projects, but keeping in mind uh, $9.4 million of that is just to service the debt that we have, that $150 million in revenue bonds. The other one I wanted to just quickly mention is the very bottom one, business support. So the stormwater utility, like any other enterprise fund, like the water department, pays back to the city of Fort Worth what's called payment in lieu of taxes. We also pay a street maintenance uh, fee that kind of helps reimburse the city for the wear and tear that goes on city streets by having a lot of heavy equipment. We also pay the city of Fort Worth an administrative services fee uh, relative to our share of kind of the overhead functions for the city, for rent, for utilities, for human resources, budget services, those sorts of things. So that business support item is kind of the cost of doing business. Between that and the debt service, those are things that we just have to do based on where we are in the life of program. The rest of the money is what I would call the discretionary budget. So that's about $22.1 million. And you can see on a percentage basis how that breaks down between those different areas. So when we did this presentation for the stakeholder committee, uh, we took all that information, which was a real big dump of information, acknowledging the fact that it was going to be very hard for them to process all this, but just to kind of give us a gut feel, which would help direct us for the rest of this initiative to update our master plan on how they see things and where they think maybe there's some room for adjusting the resources. And so we took a look at every one of those program areas on that pie chart, and we said, based on what you've heard so far, what's your gut feel on the level of resources being dedicated to that area and whether it should be reduced a lot, a little, kept the same, increased a little, a lot, or whether they just really couldn't make a decision, they just didn't have enough information. And so what we're gonna show you in these next few slides is the answers uh, that we received to that. So relative to the flood reduction capital projects, you see the different responses uh, we got, which are primarily weighted toward either keeping things the same or increasing them a little or a lot. Relative to storm drain rehab, the biggest one was keep it the same. And then again, you see the other answers. Relative to maintenance, you can see the responses we got there. Development services. Flood warning. And then the last thing that we asked them was to take all those different program areas and rank them for us in their opinion on what they thought was most important to least important. And you see the responses that we got. We'll probably be, as we go through this process, refreshing these as we give them more information uh, on these different areas. And some of this may change, but we wanted to, from the outset, just get their initial gut feel, their gut reaction on what the relative priorities were and how we might want to consider adjusting resources. So this concludes our presentation. Here is uh, our website. So anybody who would like to get more information about what's going on here, uh, that's the address that you can go to and you can see the different pieces that. You can see this presentation and other pieces of information as the schedule that has been mentioned previously. You can see how that's going to roll out. And then there's email addresses for myself and Jennifer. So anyone who's listening to this who would like to get more information, again, we direct you first to the website. If you have any more specific questions, you can email either Jennifer or I. If you would like to provide some specific input, even some input maybe on some of those questions that we asked the stakeholder committee, let us know. and We'd be glad to get your input that. But we thank you for listening to this and would welcome your input. Thank you.